Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Crypto Philanthropy, where we highlight the top giving news, trends, and the power of crypto for good. I'm your host, Nick Mikulewski, Senior Sales Manager here at The Giving Block, and as always, joined by my colleague, Pietro Moran, Head of Crypto at Shift4. Pietro, how's it going? It's going great. Actually, out of the country right now. So first international podcast for me, which is super exciting, but I uh, can't wait to kick off the week. I think we have a lot of really exciting things. Crypto has been uh, chugging along and you know we've been talking about it in the last episodes. It is finally the end of summer. People are back to work. It's uh, going to be heating up in terms of the news front. And we have a couple special topics today that I'm really excited to jump into. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as always, uh, we'll run through a couple of the topics today. We're going to do the crypto price check as always, uh, take a look at some stats and some industry news. And then, of course, our special guest, uh, David Johnson, one of our colleagues here at The Giving Block, talking about some of the policy work we're doing and also our private donor services team, which is super cool. Uh, so with that, um, as always, just a quick reminder for anyone else uh, out there listening in the nonprofit community that's crypto curious, we're still doing our $500 in Bitcoin when you get started with the giving block. Again, a great little way to kickstart your fundraising journey with us. And uh, with that, um, taking a look at the markets this week, um, you know, Petro, it's here we are in, in September, always an interesting time uh, for, for crypto in September. So uh, what's uh, what's been kind of playing out this week? You know, it's really interesting because we're recording this right after the first uh, presidential debate. And not that this is a politics podcast at all, but, you know, assets trade in relation to the folks that speak about them. And obviously the highest office here in the States being the presidency, when those folks talk about crypto or are changing in terms of their perception of how they might win and what their policy platforms are around crypto, um, these assets respond. So the past 24 hours have been a little bit volatile. We saw Bitcoin run up to about 57,000. Then it dumped earlier this uh, this morning, actually. And now it's kind of come back. So it seems like the market is just kind of figuring its way, you know, to where that level is. And, you know, folks are, you know, I would say reacting to the prediction markets around the election a bit and trading crypto, which is super liquid, super accessible, especially institutions, um, kind of like an expression of their opinion on both the election, but also on other things like macro and all the data and stuff that we talk about in the preamble to the podcast and in the crypto news segments. Um, so Bitcoin right around that 57.6 marker, Ethereum 23.58. Again, um, a lot of these assets really haven't moved in any meaningful way over the summer. So it seems like we're always reporting kind of similar news, but I would say, you know, general themes of optimism and otherwise, you know, we're probably going to be looking at more, I'd say significant price uh, variation as we go into the sort of meat of the year, you know, September, folks are coming back to Wall Street or any trading firms, people are starting to unwind from the summer. And not for nothing, like I said, we have this election where crypto is on the ballot and people are talking about it. And, you know, depending on the candidate and their level of friendliness and openness to the asset class, you know, we may see people trade around those narratives. So all that to say, the prices aren't in and of themselves too exciting this week. But uh, certainly we have the foundation for what looks like looks to be a really uh, exciting end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, moving on to, you know, the donation stats and um, we're sort of seeing that uh, trend of people kind of really getting primed. Um, you know, we have a couple stats here on the screen, you know, stable coins, again, continue to lead the way for another six figure week in, uh, in donations. You can see some of the most donated assets that we saw uh, over the past week. And, you know, to that second point where, you know, show that, you know, uh, again, uh, another strong uh, week for the number of supporters giving to charities. We didn't, we've seen that increase uh, over the last month's averages. So again, folks are back, people are getting prime, donors are coming back and starting to make those gifts. I think it's the start of what we expect to see as a, as a pretty um, healthy trend going into the end of the year, like we always see. Is this the start of, you know, when everybody's getting out there and starting to make those gifts? Could be. So, um, you know, if you're getting ready to start sending out some of the year end appeals and that year end messaging, we're starting to see more and more of those donors, um, you know, make donations. So, it could be a great uh, time to start uh, getting your year end uh, fundraising uh, into high gear. And of course, anybody needs, um, 
toolkits, ideas, strategies. Again, we've got a ton of great year-end content for you. So if anybody is curious, we'll drop another link uh, in the show notes just to make sure that we point you to our blog. We do a ton of great content. Uh, And again, if you are a client of The Giving Block, make sure that you have those year-end fundraising toolkits in hand. So that's a quick look at what we saw over the last week for the donation stats, but uh, a couple kind of interesting pieces of news um, as well, Pietro, um, you know, throw it back over to you to, to walk us through it. Yeah, hundred percent. Don't want to be too long winded here because I definitely want to tee up our special guest for the episode, but a couple of things were actually pretty inter- uh, interesting. And, you know, it's funny, I was in London yesterday, so we're going to start with a piece of UK news actually. Um, Funny enough, Ministry of Justice uh, released an article today talking about the property and digital assets bill, which was introduced into parliament, kind of discussing and recognizing crypto as personal property. A lot of folks uh, in varying jurisdictions across the planet do not have extremely, shall we say, obvious or um, sensible crypto regulation. UK has been a leader, so we do see a lot of things coming out of the UK in terms of working to... um, onboard the asset class into a framework that actually makes sense and works with both existing law or maybe paving the way for new uh, legislation that might actually enhance um, and feature the uh, benefits of crypto. All that to say, there's been this kind of legal gray area as far as my reading of the article as to how the various courts are classifying crypto, whether it's an asset, whether it's property, whether it's something altogether uh, different. And so We're starting to see some of these rules of the road come into view in the UK as it pertains to, you know, Bitcoin, NFTs, digital collectibles, right? These are something that is altogether different and new for a lot of folks. And then if you have some sort of legal dispute, arbitration, whatever it might be, how do you classify them? How do you make it make sense within the framework of common law or wherever uh, it is you're being regulated? And so the UK, uh, you know, putting a cool step forward on that front, we will monitor that and see how it progresses. This is obviously the early innings of this being introduced, um, but still positive, right? And again, we're coming off to a hot start in September on the regulatory front. It seems like people are getting their ducks in a row uh, now that they're back from the beach. And then the second one, I kind of intentionally added this. It's very interesting and um, worth reporting on. And also I think tees up some of what David will be discussing here in a bit. But um, Future Forward, which is a top democratic PAC, um, mostly supporting the, the Harris campaign efforts, has onboarded with Coinbase Commerce to accept crypto donations. So really interesting to see both parties now um, accepting crypto donations for their respective races. And I think the Trump campaign started in May. It seems like now that, you know, it's no longer the Biden campaign, the Harris campaign has kind of picked up that, um, you know, trend in terms of accepting crypto donations. I know there is a crypto for Harris movement. Um, for supporters on the Democratic side looking at her campaign and wanting to support. But uh, it seems that they're, you know, looking to get some, you know, final donations as we get closer to November and really soliciting them from the crypto community. I think I believe the um, the stat is 164 million has been raised from the crypto community in donations for the presidential race. That stat might be higher. I don't know how old that data is, but you know, all that to say, right, these are non-trivial sums of money and it's bipartisan at this point, which is kind of something um, that helps me lead into our guest, right? Bipartisan effort to discuss crypto, advocate for the industry on the Hill and in the relevant kind of halls of power in the United States, um, which is exactly what our special guest for today is going to be talking about. So would love to invite David Johnson, who is general counsel here at the Giving Block and is kind of an instrument um, that he's somebody who does a little bit of everything. You know, uh, David does quite a bit of advocacy work and also works with our large donors uh, and runs our private donor services arm of the business. David, want to say thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to see you guys. This is great. Um, We're always super happy to have fellow colleagues, but also experts in their relevant field. If you don't mind, just uh, I know Nick and I know you rather well, but Mm -hmm. folks may not, uh, who are new listeners or returning listeners. Could you just give us a sense about what you're up to? Because first of all, I think I could probably list 40 different things you do here. But I know today we're talking about a few specific uh, interest areas and where you're really sort of fighting the good fight for the industry as a whole and for nonprofits who are accepting crypto donations. Um, If you don't mind, just give us a little bit of a sense of what you've been working on lately. 
Yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm a general counsel here, so I do all those uh, legal things. Um, I came to the Giving Block after 10 years with a law firm in D.C. doing technology law. So that's kind of my background. But once I arrived, um, I uh, enjoyed getting my hands dirty in different uh, agreements and um, partnerships, relationships with certain key clients and donors and the like. So I've expanded to do a lot of other things, some of which we'll talk about today. Um, so uh, you mentioned the policy work. We don't get directly involved as, as say, lobbyists, uh, but yet we find ways where we can strategically insert ourselves sort of as the, the voice for nonprofit and crypto community, right? The giving block has always been at that intersection of philanthropy and, and crypto, and we have a unique voice there that uh, other entities just don't. So when we enter ourselves into a conversation with folks doing lobbying around crypto, They've never thought about it from the philanthropy nonprofit perspective. And likewise, when we talk to nonprofits um, who are thinking about policies coming up, how it affects them, they, they hadn't thought about the crypto nuances. So that's where we like to get involved in, as you said, a bipartisan way. We're not getting involved in anything um, uh, related to individual parties or, or politics necessarily, but areas where it affects our clients, we're happy to, to get involved. Yeah, and David, you, so the the crypto donation appraisal policy, um, it, you know, for for folks who may not, um, you know, be as close to this, um, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of like set, setting the scene a little bit, um, yeah. you know, what was the sort of you know the 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 crux of the issue here, and 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 how do we you know start to tackle that? Yeah, yeah I'll do uh, do my best to make it make it quick. Um, the so if you think about it, the giving block, really, if we have a core mission, it's around making giving easy for both donors and, and nonprofits, right? And this is one area where we identified a lot of friction that seemed unnecessary. So um, in simplest terms, the IRS looks at any donation in, in property as needing to be appraised. So if I donate a car, nobody has any idea without an appraisal whether that's worth $1,000 or $100,000, right? So you need an appraisal for that. That makes sense. Same with art or other things. Um, crypto and stocks are both categories of property. If I donate 10 Apple stock, though, there's an exception in the uh, tax code that says everyone can look on the market that day and see what Apple was trading on. There's a formula that says you take the high, the low, the average of them, that's your value. Um, so it's easy to have a formula. There's no reason to have CPAs do research to tell you what Apple was trading at on a given day. Um, crypto, even though the data available regarding crypto transactions is, is arguably um, you know, greater than there is for stock, that same exception doesn't apply. So you have, and my, my favorite example is in the case of stable coins, I could donate $100,000 of USDC and I need to go get a CPA after the fact to write a report and they're going to charge me and they're going to tell me that that $100,000 USDC is worth $100,000. Um, and so that's something we identified as being unnecessary, uh, an unnecessary amount of friction in the process. And so we've, uh, we wrote a letter to the Senate Finance Committee who was asking a question about this requirement. Um, we visited the Hill and we've been working with Coin Center, um, Blockchain Association, um, with uh, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, co-authored letter with us. So really trying to pull together a range of folks from within the nonprofit and crypto communities to understand this would be a simple layup relative to a lot of the policy that folks are trying to pass uh, in Washington, D.C. these days. Yeah, I love it. And um you know, on, on that same theme of, you know, making things, um, you know, easier. And I guess actually before we kind of get to that, um, you know, some of the, maybe do you want to talk about some of the, the events here? I know you highlighted a couple of the, you know, the big, um, uh, sort of themes here, America for crypto, stand up for crypto. Maybe you just want yep. to talk about some of the movements that are going on, um, that are, that have been catching some headlines, certainly in the, in the last year for sure. Yeah, sure. So, so last year, um, uh, TGB co-founder Alex Wilson and I went with um, Coinbase and many others as part of the Stand with Crypto, first Stand with Crypto Day in Washington, D.C. That's what you see in some of the pictures. We're visiting, walking the halls of Congress, visiting um, uh, members of Congress and their staff, trying to explain uh, both the appraisal issue I just mentioned, but other, other areas where the crypto industry generally is looking for more clarity. Um, and so that's, again, an area where 
we're inserting ourselves really to be a voice for nonprofits and and their interests in this space. We'll continue to do that, look for opportunities. Um, we will likely find opportunities for our clients to the extent they're interested to even participate, whether it's helping write a letter, signing a letter, or even going to the Hill with us at some point. We continue to look for opportunities um, to both be involved ourselves and and get our clients involved to the extent they're interested. So, so let us know if... Um, if uh, you you do have an interest in getting involved, some some upcoming events that uh, America loves or Stand with Crypto is putting together as part of their America loves crypto uh, program is uh, in in the next few days. There's a Detroit, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Washington D.C. events. These are um, more concerts than than boring policy discussions, but. Uh, if you show up at Philadelphia, then um, you'll get to hear me and uh, um, uh, Toomey, McHenry, and a few other congressional leaders that that are involved in policy and some other folks from Coinbase and others who will, who will be talking. So I'll be in Philadelphia speaking, representing uh, TGB and our, our parent company, Shift4. Um, but all these events that I just listed there are, are free, show up, free food and drink, um, have a concert and hear uh, just like, you know, 20 minute spiel about where uh, crypto is uh, being a force for good and how policy makers can help uh, support that. Love it. It's like uh, a crypto in the, fr- or crypto in the front and a uh, concert in the back, right? Sort of business and uh, business and pleasure, which is, it's an awesome way I think to, uh, to, to present that. I had one question for you here, David, because I know you're doing a lot of this sort of demystification or just education or, across some of these folks who have a lot on their plate in terms of policymakers, right? Yeah. For a lot of us who aren't privy to those conversations, we're not in the room, we're not listening to some of the feedback. Curious, like how do those conversations tend to tip, you know, tend to typically go? Is it pretty candid? Are folks pretty open? Like just for our audience, give us a sense on what you've seen and, and maybe felt in terms of, uh, the vibe on the hill from from folks who are you know obviously entertaining crypto advocates as like yourself and yep. and others um how's that how's that been going and you know not that you have to make any uh you know bets on what the where the what the future holds here but curious to get your take on it yeah a few things overall i would say um well, generally, you know, a member of Congress's office's office door is fairly widely open. I think people who go for the first time are surprised that you can, you know, walk through a metal detector, but otherwise you can freely walk into any of these office buildings on the Hill, go to your member of Congress and say, hey, I care about X, Y, Z, and they listen to you. So um, it, it getting the meeting and getting in front of the staff and or the member of Congress um, isn't isn't too tough. From there, though, you really have to tell a message that's going to resonate with them specifically explaining how this change you're requesting is going to benefit their constituents, right? So if you're going into a, a, you know, a member from a given district in Pennsylvania and you're coming in with a bunch of say clients or or folks from California and explaining why we care so much about this they're like okay so go talk to you know the California member so you really have to relate it to something that they care about and then i would say folks are very receptive but there's still a lot of misconceptions about crypto you'd be surprised um there are some members uh staff that are super um have done a lot of research and they're ready to have the conversation. Many of them are still coming in with the misconceptions we hear within the general public and, and the nonprofit world for folks who haven't been exposed that they say, you know, this is tools of criminals and, and the stuff that folks who have not really looked into it, it just have the, you know, the immediate reaction. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it does require a lot of education. That's where working with, Coin Center, Blockchain Association, Stand with Crypto, and these different groups that we work together with, that's where that's super important because they know where to meet the given staff member where where they are, right? In some cases, they're going to tell you before you go in, these guys haven't had any exposure to crypto as far as we know. Let's start from the beginning. Um, and in other cases, they say they know what they're doing. Let's jump right to how this relates to nonprofits. So it 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 really helps to have someone who knows the halls of Congress and know who's your who, whose office you're going into um, to do some of that prep work. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, love the fact that you know we're we're 
continuing to sort of carry that torch, you know, for nonprofits and philanthropy and making things easier and, and, and blazing a trail. And, you know, I think leads in nicely to one of the other, you know, many things that you do here, private donor services in terms of making, um, you know, some of those donations and those transactions um, easier for clients, donors themselves. Um, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just set up a little bit about, you know, what private donor services does. I think it's one of the coolest things we do. Uh, yeah. I think sometimes people are surprised to learn that we even go into um, the weeds on this. But um, yeah, tell us a little bit about private donor services. Yeah. So the the way I usually like to explain it is to describe what it what it's not, right? So if you are a nonprofit with a donation form uh, on on your website and our website, and someone wants to donate a Bitcoin or uh, any value in crypto, um, the form is there, ready to go. You don't need me. You don't need our private donor services team. That's that's super easy. Almost everything else that gets bigger, more complicated, you know, different parties involved, um, then then that's where private donor services come in. So it's sort of like where things are need that extra touch, we get involved. So it, it can be many different things. But usually it's it's a client nonprofit coming to us and saying, um, we have a, a donor with a special need, we have a certain, um, you know, a size of a transaction or a type of an asset that doesn't fit neatly into the uh, you know, expectations of, of, uh, the, the standard form. Um, yeah, so, so we get involved and it's, it's just problem solving, right. With anything else, it's, you start by asking questions. What's in, you know, in many cases it's driven by a donor and their, their particular requirements. So what are, what do they need? What do they want to get out of the transaction? And it's kind of us, the charity and the donor as, as, uh, three parties just sort of figuring out how to execute a transaction. It's, Super rewarding too, because at the end of the day, we're helping land in many cases completely mission changing donations for for these nonprofits, um, and there's nothing more rewarding than that. Yeah, absolutely, that's awesome. Um, and you know, there are on some occasions where these are coming in, you know, from donors too, right? It's not always the nonprofit introducing us to to the donors. Is is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so we we have relationships with some uh, ongoing donors, or donors find our website, find us independently. Um, we also have relationships with different advisors, financial advisors, legal tax advisors that say, "Hey, you know, we have a a family office, a donor that wants to um, wants to make a donation, and and can you guys get involved and help?" So, yeah, absolutely. In fact, a, a lot of donations. Uh, go to charities that are working with us already. In some cases, a donor comes and says, you know, that's part of why we have to get involved is because they're saying, I want to work with this charity. They don't take crypto. Can you guys help? And there are ways we can, we can do that either by signing them up or using, using, um, you know, partner entities to, to execute that transaction. But, but yeah, a lot of times, in fact, it is, it is donors coming to us. And um, you know, on that point, we see donors of, of all types. Um, you might be surprised. There are a lot of um, um, donors that are young, but many that are old as well. You know, grandparents that are, that are sitting on a large appreciated uh, uh, stock of crypto. Um, we're seeing donations to alma maters. We're seeing sometimes donors want to give to a um, basically a, an index of, of organizations within a given cause. And they don't necessarily have one charity, but they say, I care a lot about, you know, technology, education, developing world or something. Can you guys help me put together a, a basically a strategy to, to get a portfolio of donations out to a set of organizations? Yeah, that's amazing. And as we go into year end, I mean, what, what does it look like for, for the PDS team? I mean, um, you guys are, I'm sure getting, getting ready for, for the busy season, just like we are. And just like our clients are. Yeah, exactly. We we um, deal with the same sort of cyclical nature in the sense that it is uh, a lot about year end giving. The only thing I would say is because of the size and sophistication of some of these transactions, um, we really do need to get started earlier in many cases. Not that we don't take requests and figure out how to get it done when they come in the middle of December, but um, a lot of times, I mean, I've, I've had conversations for maybe the last six months about 
donations that haven't come in yet, folks are planning for this year end, right? So people are thinking ahead. We actually get a lot of inquiries around um, tax season. So people are having conversations this last spring with their CPA and they're going, okay, I really got to think about what's appreciated this next year, what I'm going to offload for, for the uh, subsequent tax filing. So yeah, it's cyclical. The other thing I would say is, um, and you guys touched on this a little bit with the, the pricing uh, market discussion at the top of the podcast, but the, um, we have a bunch of donors who are watching the prices, right? Like everyone else. And they're saying, this is my number. I'm waiting to see this number. And then here's the approximate value. And this is the charity it's going to, you know, be ready. And so we've, we've been ready for a few months for a number of those. And um, we're, uh, you know, with any luck uh, in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll have a good, uh, good giving season. A lot of those are I, come in. That makes so much sense to me as I think about it from maybe the more institutional perspective and, and some of the highlights we give on, you know, a lot of maybe more traditional players and sort of the cottage industry around financial services, right? Professionals that might be talking to you, you know, maybe as a parting question or final note here, would love to understand the level of depth that you go into when it comes to working with not just the two other parties of donor and recipient and nonprofit, but also maybe that advisor or that person that might be in the ear of a donor who is potentially a little more sophisticated or maybe planning out with in relation to a tax bill that they're anticipating after a year of, you know, financial activity or trading, how, you know, how far does PDS go in terms of doing the relevant education handholding and, or um, just getting in the trenches, so to speak of facilitating all that when you, know, you probably have people getting on the phone with you in uh, you know, the middle of December saying, I finally know what I owe. So now it's time to, right. to make something happen. Right. Like I imagine yeah, your yeah. end of the year is pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say we're we're involved in those discussions, although we're not giving the the tax, financial, or legal advice. So we right. we're usually working with the advisor just to make sure they understand the process. Um, you know, um, sometimes clarifying with them what what we understand the tax implications to be, but letting them get their own advice. Um, and so a lot of times we're working hand in hand with the advisor. We might have a discussion with the advisor, you know, before they even talk to their client, just to say, you know this is the they're telling us the advice they plan to give and we say yeah okay that that sounds consistent with what we're seeing and we put together a plan together for the client so yeah we work closely with a lot of advisors and um, the other value we provide is we know advisors whether it's financial tax legal um, appraisal appraisers um, who are very qualified not only within their field generally but specifically working with crypto um, and there we we hear from a lot of donors who say you know I've got a, an accountant who's great, but I came to them with a crypto question and they don't seem to have any idea. Could you recommend mm -hmm. someone similar, you know, with, uh, could you recommend a, a, an estate lawyer or something who's, who's fluent in this area? So, so we're often making referrals um, to those experts that we're, you know, also working with and getting referrals uh, from as well. So the advisor's best friend, I, I did actually have one more thing that that um, comment inspired, which is to say, I think, given the breadth and depth and sophistication of what PDS offers to a donor, you know, in terms of the assistance that you're, you're offering, you know, a lot of people are probably thinking, is this some exclusive club? Like, how do I get access? Is this going to cost me extra, right? Just from a logistical perspective, um, maybe you could enlighten us on that. I know, obviously I'm leading the witness a bit here because I know the answer, but you know, for the folks yeah, that yeah. maybe have never either used PDS or are a potential donor or a nonprofit thinking like, wow, maybe this is some way I can cultivate some of those donors that, are yep. on the more sophisticated side and you can be that olive branch, uh, give us a sense on what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, the short answer is it doesn't cost anything in addition to, you know, it, it, it's included with your, um, subscription at the giving block, uh, as a, as a charity. Um, and if you're a donor who comes to us and says, I want to donate, maybe it's not even to a giving block charity. We would, we would work with you and we would take only our standard transaction fee. There's no, um, additional fee for, for donors or anything. So a lot of what we're doing is goodwill, trying to educate the donor and trying to get more donations across the board generally. So, so we really try to make this accessible to everyone. I would say just in terms of kind of expectations around size, when we see donors giving, let's say 50,000 or more, uh, $50,000, $100,000 worth or more in crypto, a lot of times, even if it's a fairly simple Bitcoin donation to a donation form, 
they still like to get us involved and say, sometimes we're literally on the phone with them as they're making the transaction, confirming that the donation landed, we're doing a test transaction ahead of time. So in terms of size, there's no hard limit, but typically at those levels, we start to see people wanting a little more handholding and a tr test transaction before they send the full amount, that sort of thing. Um, but we, we deal with much smaller amounts. Again, if it's like a, an asset that's not easily supported, we try to try to figure it out, even if they're smaller amounts. So we very accessible, both for charities and, and donors. Yeah. Well, we are primed for giving season. I'm sure our clients and our listeners are primed. David's team is primed. Um, so for our listeners out there and certainly nonprofit fundraisers, again, if, um, you know, if you, if you do, um, start having some of those conversations, even, even come across a crypto conversation that maybe you're not entirely equipped for. Our team is here. This is, it's, it's the bread and butter of what we do. So don't feel like that uh, conversation is intimidating. Uh, we've seen a lot of things, but, um, uh, but certainly our, our, our tools are, are primed for uh, the year end rush. But if you have some of those conversations that might be a little bit outside the box, David, myself, and, and everybody here at the Giving Block is standing ready to make that giving experience as easy and frictionless as possible, both for you and for your supporters. So I guess with that, we went a little bit longer this episode, but it was fantastic. So David, thanks so much for joining us. And on behalf of Pietro and everybody else at the Giving Block, we'll see you next week. 